Thank you very much. Some of y'all are old friends and welcome new friends. Um, I'm going to cover a lot today. I think that, um, as you know, about in 2003, Sally Yarian asked me to write a class on farm and ranch practices, and it was a four-hour class. And then shortly thereafter, she people seemed to like it, so it went to a seven-hour class. And I've taught it around the state at very various places. Uh, it's been a lot of fun for me. I, I spend a lot of time updating the class. I'm active in a lot of different things around the state, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about as we go. We're going to run about two hours today. Um, I'm not going to take, take a break, but you're not going to offend me if you get up and wander around. My students do it all the time, so please, please go. I'm going to go ahead. Today I'm going to talk about several things. One is fiduciary duties. I'll give an overview of farm and ranch from my opinion. Then I'll talk about fiduciary duties, and you read the list as much as I can about marketplace. A little bit about the contract, the new contract form. Uh, but I'll remind you, I'm not an attorney, and I think we've got, we have to be very careful about practicing law, and I'll tell you some problems I have with the contract when it comes to these larger farm and ranch deals I think are important to consider. Talk a little bit about surveys and easements, uh, water, uh, minerals, and then I want to share some things with you about some, content, some cases in the case law that I've, I think will be important to farm and ranch practices as we, as we go. Okay, sure, please help yourself. So, um, understand I'm going to give some opinions today. You don't have to do what I do. Uh, this is a forum. It's an exchange of ideas. I've had a broker's license for, about, hard to believe, 40 years now. Uh, I've done a, I was a developer for a long time in Houston, did 20 major deals, survived the bank wars, didn't go bust, and moved back home to Austin. Uh, I'm a sixth-generation Texan for what that's worth. Uh, I think farm and ranch is probably the best investment we can make with our money, and I'll tell you a lot of reasons why that we now have kind of a changing marketplace, but I think it's a great place to put our money. I always like to talk a little bit about brief walk through history. Uh, most people don't realize in the United States how tied we are to Spanish colonial history. I've written books about it and spoken many times and written a lot of journal articles about it. Ranching in North America, north of Rio Grande, started at the inside corner where Cibolo Creek meets the San Antonio River. Uh, it started in the early 1700s. Uh, all the practices that we have in farm and ranch and, and actual ranching practices came from Spanish colonial days. Most people don't realize that. If you want to really see early Spanish colonial ranching, you can't see it in the area I'm going to show you now. If you go down to Espiritu Santo and especially Presidio La Bahia in Goliad, you'll see some of the finest examples of ancient 1700 tools and things that the ranchers used. It's very important. I don't have time to read this to you, but a UT professor years ago wrote in one of my good friend David Weber, sadly, who passed away, an SMU scholar, wrote about ranching at one time. And one of the things that was, frankly, hides were more valuable than silver for many years, for almost two centuries, in the Spanish colonial world. In fact, the English stole the hides from the Spanish outposts all around the world from 1500 on. Hides were major. As the Spaniards came across and moved into the Entradas into Texas, anywhere through northern Mexico, in fact, they always dropped off a stallion and a mare and a bull and a cow. And a lot of the Spanish scholars I like to say this, the Spaniards lived in a porcine fog. They had pigs with them everywhere. Our feral hogs came from the Spaniards dropping off pigs all through the times from 1550 on through Texas. Uh, the reason we, have wild, we had wild horses and wild longhorn cattle were because of what the Spanish did. Now, this is from John Jackson's book, Los Mostinos, about the original parts of ranching in Texas. And that funny-looking LE thing up there, kind of toward the middle of the top, is my brand. It was the Trevacio family brand at a ranch called Las Mulas. I went and acquired that brand about 20 years ago. Uh, it's a terrible brand if you're for rustling cattle because you can pretty much easily change it. And the people in Wilson County thought I was crazy when I drew it into the Real Property Records book. But because I write books and things about Spanish colonial ranching, I wanted to honor that. Mules were more valuable in the Spanish world than horses, much more valuable. Uh, and that's a whole other story. If you look around the, the, the little hook looking, uh, you'll see it toward the left and bottom, you'll see a little hook looking thing. That was a, a spot of missions, laboris, where there's actually a fort there that's been covered up where the Spanish raised goats and things. 
The Spaniards created a world around San Antonio, we'll talk about water, that was a unique world in North America. Part of that included cattle raising, cattle ranching, and there's a distinction between we won't talk about, but I thought it's interesting to show you that. The grass, when I, at my place, I own a place that's not as big as that big ranch, but on Cibolo Creek, I've got about a mile of frontage there. I almost don't like my place when it rains too much because I can't walk through it. The grass is so thick and so high. It's beyond belief. Uh, so you can imagine what this would have like, been like in those days. In the lower area, of course, in the Wild Horse Desert, that's where in the 1780s the Spanish moved in, there was no surface water, so they had to dig groundwater wells. In fact, they had less than three weeks to dig a groundwater well because they couldn't live there in the Wild Horse Desert. That's around Hebronville, and in my water rights class, I talk a lot about some of the ancient water wells that are still there, which is really fascinating to see. Um, the Spaniards created these communities, and our, again, please remember, our ranching practices fall back to Spain. Now, our greatest problems and future challenges, I think, come from what we always face in farm and ranch, and that is water and droughts the norm. Uh, we've got, we're in another drought now. We'll continue to have droughts. Another thing I think is going to really change everything is rising interest rates, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, I think it's something that you'll already see the REITs have been bailing out of property, especially retail, for the last two years without anybody really knowing it uh, because the rates were too low. And I don't have time to talk about how much I know about the border because I owned a ranch in Mexico we lost to the cartels. But I can tell you this much. If you think things are better in the Mexico and the border, don't kid yourself. They're worse than they've ever, ever been. Uh, I, I just literally stopped to fight my children from going to Mexico. Uh, I went and test, I was asked to te uh, speak at a large international water conference in Cancun, and I went straight to my hotel, locked myself up, spoke, and went home. And now they've had big problems in the Cancun area. It's everywhere. Uh, it's, I think, our biggest national security threat is what's going on with the cartels, and I could tell you stories and stories about what's happening to my students along the border. Nonetheless, this is the drought last week. Um, Obviously, we've had a little rain now, but the Panhandle's gone through terrible drought, a terrible drought for the last almost 100 days. In fact, at one time, it was that darker level exceptional drought. Uh, it's a real problem. But drought's the norm in Texas, right? I mean, that's what we're used to, and we'll talk about that in a minute. If you put in Google National Drought Monitor, you can pull this up every day, and they change it every single day. And it's important to consider as we go through farm and ranch. What's the first thing you got to do if you're in the farm and ranch business? You got to walk the land, okay? Understand that real estate is a three-dimensional product. My younger students don't get that. They've enjoyed Google Earth. They've enjoyed text messages. They've enjoyed all this other stuff. They don't want to walk that 5,000-acre ranch in Rock Springs in August. But you got to do it, period, and it's not fun. And if you can see, I think you can, that little bitty old bird there, that quail, is pretty much what holds the ranches in the, in the wild horse desert together, not, not the big Santa Gertrude's cattle. It's, it's, far, it's honey. That little old bird's on my place, and we've been through some ups and downs on quail. Uh, we've had a little bit of break on fire ants. We've had more quail. But if you know anything about quail, they're the most sensitive little creatures on earth, but they're my favorite. But you've got to walk the land. If you're not willing to go out and walk the land, and get your clients to wear snake boots with you, get out of the farm and ranch business, period. Especially if you're doing larger ranches, especially in South Texas, because there are things out there that you want to see. Now, let me tell you things that you want to look for, and I'll probably publish this and send this to you in an email. First of all, when you walk around the land, I think above all else, you want to see if there's a water well, a drinking water well there, and see how close it is to the septic field. Most Schedule Bs in, this title, in the title policy will say, like on mine in Wilson County, it said, subject to the septic tank regulation of Wilson County. It doesn't say subject to the groundwater Dis conservation district rules and regulations, which it should. And I've written a new article about that, and I've talked at the UT Law School conferences about it. In fact, we were lucky enough through work that I did in the Austin Board and others to finally get one line added to the property code, to the, to the disclosure notice about two sessions ago that said 
whether or not you're in a groundwater conservation district or not. And I'll tell you how that's very, very, very important. But the bottom line is you've got to see whether you're close to the septic tank and you can test the water. There, you, want to, you don't pull the water out of the hose. You test it at the well site, take it, keep it cool, and go to a testing service for about 50 bucks and see if there's E. coli bacteria in it. If there is, you've got a real problem. You want to see all the mineral contents too. People can refer to the salt contents. It's not just sodium chloride. It's all kind of mineral salts. That's something you want to advise your client to do, right? If I'm going to be listing the agent as a seller's agent, I want my client to do that for me before I list that, that, that property. Because there are actually situations where when that well starts pumping and creates a cone of depression, even if it's further away than the 1,500 feet, you could suck up that coliform bacteria. You don't want to do that, okay? You look at roads. You look at ingress and egress. We'll talk about easements in a minute. You look at any indication of old easements across the property that are, that are, not, that are not filed of record. You want to look at every water well. You want to look at all the irrigation equipment. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. You want to look for abandoned water wells. To see TCEQ, I've been, on a, I've been asked to speak several times to a task force they have of all the state agencies to try to go up and cover up, cover up all the close 2 million, they think, abandoned wells in Texas. There's also abandoned oil wells. Those of you that were here in the 1980s in the Austin Chalk well days, a lot of people just left those wells open. I got to tell you something, those are a real hazard and a problem for you as a landowner. What else do you see? Trash dumps on these farms and ranches, right? Everywhere there's a little draw, they try to use it at one time to, 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 as an erosion control. How many dildren bottles are in there? What's in, what's in those trash dumps? You got to get up off your butt and walk those ranches and see what's there. There could be a time someday when somebody downstream is going to find something in the water and they'll come back and trace it to your wash that's coming through that trash dump and there's some kind of problem there. Fences, you know, what's the next door neighbor doing next to your fence? If he's got a, a, a deer blind that's pointed towards your property, you might have a problem there, right? You know, you ought to go look at that. You got to walk those fences. You look for obvious flood damages, flood plains. You look for old abandoned equipment, old bar bar everywhere, ruins of old buildings, and every now and then you hear about somebody going into a barn, and we don't have knock on wood the killer bees as much, but an old fellow died a few years ago walking into one of those nightmares, okay? Look for electric services, obvious hazards. Got a bunch of no trespass signs up there. It's kind of like when you look at a residential house that's got a whole bunch of burglar bars on it. That might give you an indication of something, right? You want to think about that. You want to look for any indication of anything that's undocumented on the property, any kind of undocumented leases and things. Of course, you want to look at stock tanks, old dams, hunting blinds, and wildlife ag valu valuation criteria. In other words, I've got quail teepees on my place, which are where the quail can run and hide from the hawks under things. You want to see what those are because if your ag valuation is based on a wildlife plan, which is legal, you got to understand what's there. You don't want, you want to avoid the rollback, okay? And I file a 40-page report every year with the Wilson County Appraisal District with photographs to prove that I've done all the practices. Those are important to consider. Now, I'm going to real quickly give you a few ideas of, of things you might want to consider. One of the best sites is agweg.com, okay? Um, the next, of course, is the Texas AgriLife Extension. County agents, if you're in the farm and ranch business, you got to get to know the county agent, period. They're the nicest, most helpful people on the face of this earth. And I've worked with them for 40 years. They're a wonderful source. AgWeb has got a great young attorney named Tiffany Dow who writes wonderful art letter at light letter for, uh, doc, uh, articles about basic cases. You're not a lawyer. You're not interpreting the law, but you want to see what these cases say to give you an idea to keep you current. Other things, I'll publish this to y'all, but all those are sources. The Real Estate Center at Texas A&M, if you're not using that site, you're paying for it. They're the, another group of the finest and most, uh, most professional men and women I've ever known. Judon Fambro, before you're tired, had written about 1,000 articles about everything. And those are the things we can read and help ourselves. The Texas Farm Brewer, the Cattle Raiders Association, a group that I'm very proud to be involved in. David Faust and others are members of the Texas Alliance of Land Brokers. Livestock Weekly, 
you don't get Livestock Weekly, you ought to read it if you're going to be in Farm and Ranch. It's out of San Angelo, Texas. Uh, appraisal district, feed stores, implement dealers, water well drillers. You need to run, read the Agricultural Code. You need to look at the Comptroller's Office site. Alliance of Groundwater Districts, Water Conservation Association, all those other names. If you're going to be a professional in this business, it is so complicated. These are sources you ought to use and read because they're up to date all the time. The one that will frustrate you the most will be the TCEQ, and we'll talk about that soon. Now, I wrote a little article a few years ago in, in our Texas Realtor magazine about five resources for farm and ranch clients, and one of the things I talked about, of course, was open range and closed range status in Texas. And I thought we'd have about 100 questions about that, and I got one. And we'll be talking about open, closed range, so you'll know the difference in this state. It's really complicated. I think an overview of all farm and ranch at this point is, I don't know if the market price is too high. I don't know if it's overheated. It should sure change. One challenge we have are eminent domain cases. And with power lines and oil and gas, you got no rights, folks. Understand that. You can argue the value if you've got enough money to pay for the appraisers and get the right comps and the lawyers. Bottom line, that oil and gas fellow, like I talked to an old oil and gas attorney one night when he was drunk as a skunk, he looked at me and said, I'm going to draw that line and that pipeline goes across your property whether you like it or not. And he added some expletives. He said, then we'll talk about the money later. And I'm going to offer you $5 when it's worth $500,000 and let you come argue with me. That's fine. I mean, we're an oil and gas state. Understand that. For a while, farm rents uh, and farm leases, we could make some money on our farms again when corn was $7 a bushel. Now it's under three, you know. And that's only if you owned your equipment and owned the land and you had an irrigation system, right? Have you, have you priced a big Dooley John Deere tractor lately? You know, nobody can, nobody can afford it hardly. Shale oil and gas is something to be careful about. We'll look at the new mineral rights addendum, which I was lucky enough to be on the task force that wrote that thing. Uh, but you've got to be very, very careful. Oil prices are stabilized between $50 and $65 a barrel, but whether it comes back an eagle for shale again, I don't know. Uh, our natural gas is too cheap, $2.65 an MCF. And, of course, maybe the new LNG terminals all along our coast will help us have an open market. Uh, I'm worried about, again, the overview sometime that some of these county appraisal districts may come after ag valuation and challenge it. I think we'll have a lot of support from the legislature. But when you hear certain appraisal district chief appraisers say their, their duty is to raise money for the county, that's not their duty, but it scares me. Uh, I represent a lot of appraisal districts in defense cases, and so I love what they've done. If you remember the days when we had 3,300 taxing jurisdictions in Texas that all valued it in a different way. The appraisal district system works, but it's something to be concerned about. Now let's talk about fiduciary duties real quick. And this is kind of the, the salt in this, in this, in this seminar. Um, we want fiduciary duties. That makes us a profession. If we don't add value to these deals, the Zillow's, and the Googles and the new king of the world, Jeff Bezos, is going to take over our business, okay? We can, some of this real estate activity can be automated. And I just did a big presentation from our class yesterday about how many jobs we're going to lose in the next 20 years to automation. So we've got to have fiduciary duties, which makes us a profession. That means it takes a lot of work to be a farm and ranch agent. Now, the rules of the Real Estate Commission are where you find our fiduciary duties. All that's interconnected to the Texas Occupations Code, the Real Estate License Act. And if you're a member of ABOR or another board, you're a member of TAR and the NAR, you're also obligated to their code of ethics. They're all interconnected. Now, if you're sponsoring agents, don't let anybody tell you that you're not responsible for everything they do. Don't let anybody tell you you're not responsible for every bit of your personal assets don't go to, to fix a screw-up they made. You've got to be really careful. I don't sponsor agents anymore. They don't want to work for me. They've got to basically memorize the rules. They've got to memorize the License Act. I'll give them a pop quiz every week. I'm 66 years old. I, I'm not going to have somebody make a mistake on some kind of deal they shouldn't be doing, and then I get to pay for it, right? Luckily, we've made some changes that helped us a little bit. 
Don't try to read all this. I'll go through it with you kind of quickly, but, you know, where it's found is in 531.1. If you go to the first part of the Rules of Real Estate Commission, the Canons of Ethics, that's the law. If you're not a member of NAR, you don't have to abide by the Code of Ethics of the NAR, even though it's the industry standard for 1,350,000 of us. But since 1976, this is the law for Texas, okay? You're a fiduciary. If you're a fiduciary, where stockbrokers aren't fiduciaries, right? We've had the retirement manager folks just go crazy they've got fiduciary duties. The number one thing is you got to put your client's interest ahead of yours. When I teach my water rights class, the first thing I always say is, you got to take your hat off today. You're going to look at this as an investor, but you also want to look at it as a broker, and I'm here to talk to you about the brokerage. And I had a lawyer friend of mine say, well, what's the difference between an investor and a broker? Well, as an investor, you owe your duties to yourself. As a broker, you owe your duties to your client. That's the biggest difference. And believe me, it's, it's serious and it's real. I have testified the biggest judgment when I was on the plaintiff's side of a case in Houston that we won. Uh, I was the only expert on the plaintiff's side. We won a $16 million judgment against some brokers for violating their fiduciary duties. It's got some real teeth. Okay? Yet you still have to treat other parties of transaction fairly. And the R Code of Ethics, Article 1, says similarly the same thing. says you've got to treat other parties honestly. You also have to be faithful observer to the trust. Okay? As a fiduciary, it's a relationship of trust and confidence. All right? As a fiduciary, it's almost like dealing with our friends at the IRS. If any of you all work for the IRS, please forget my name. But bottom line is you're considered guilty until you prove yourself innocent. Same thing goes to your fiduciary. If I've got a great aunt that lives in the basement and she's incompetent, I'm writing her checks, i got to prove if, she's, if her, my other cousins are mad at me, which I don't have that, but if, if she, I've got to prove I was honest and loyal to her. Okay? That's a serious thing. I mean, our fiduciary duties are serious, and we don't spend enough time talking about it. Those of you who have taken my classes know every class I teach, I start up with this. Okay? Because it's serious. We've got to think about it. Now, what does scrupulous and meticulous mean? Well, we didn't, add, we didn't uh, define that until about 2010 in Ethics Manual 4.0. Remember, we have to take, now we've got to take eight hours of legal one and two. used to be six hours of legal and ethics. Scrupulously, acting in strict regard for what is considered right or proper. Punctiliously, that means paying great attention, exact, and painstaking. Look at meticulously. Marked by extreme or excessive care. Extreme or excessive care and considers the details careful. Now, that ought to wake you up to that, you know. I mean, that's, that's hard. I've actually seen some appeal court throw, throw out a judgment that we've had on fiduciary duties for a smaller amount up in the Third Circuit because they thought real estate, I really think the judge thought the real estate agents are too dumb to be able to live up to this standard. I really think that. I don't want a big judge that's mad at me. But, I mean, it was shocking to me with what happened that they, they did that. But understand, this is something that is, is the way you define those things. Integrity, 531.2, it's fatality, integrity, competency. 531.2 says you've got to employ prudence and caution. That means you've got to do something, okay, so as to avoid misrepresentation anywise, acts of commission or omission. You hold yourself out to be a farmer and specialist. What's an omission? You don't walk the land. You don't notice the oil well there. You don't notice the water well there. You don't look at the, you don't read the title commitment that comes out. All those kind of things are an omission. If you're in the commercial brokerage business, there are a hundred omissions you could do. How often does it come up in a lawsuit? Well, it's like my old friend Bum Phillips said. Most people don't realize before he coached the Oilers, years before he coached at Jacksonville High School, Coach Pete Lamons. He always had this great saying, he said, there's two kinds of professional football coaches, them that's fired and them that's going to be fired. In real estate brokerage, if you're in it long enough, there's two kinds of brokers, them that's going to be sued or them that are being sued, and you've got to avoid it. How do you avoid it? It's by being scrupulous and meticulous. It's by keeping notes with everything you do. What you write down when you deal with a client on your notepad is as good a document as something come from the county. And you can stand in front of that jury when they're accusing you of something. You don't talk to the lawyers, you talk to the jurors. I did everything I could. Put it in writing. That's what you got to do. It's a pain. But you got to understand about these things out there. People in my sorry generation started not taking responsibility for anything. 
I bought this. I'm unhappy with it, but it's not my fault. I didn't make the wrong suit. Somebody misrepresented it to me. Okay? And so think about when you go to a new doctor. They give you a clipboard with a bunch of questions. Part of that's to understand about your health, but also they want to get their money from you someday, right? Well, think about that when you deal with a client, that you've got to be careful in what you deal with that client from day one and understand that client may be your best friend now, but people are funny about their money. So I think you've got to be prepared for that. Competency, you've got to be up to date on state and local issues. Okay? Farm and ranch practice is a very local business, right? You've got to understand the local areas. You've got to go into those local business cultures. You've got to be up to date on those issues. There are different issues around the state in farm and ranch than in different parts of the state, right? You've got to exercise judgment, skill, and performance to work. 535.2 says brokers owe the very highest fiduciary duty. That's the second time they tell you that, okay? The third time they tell you that is 535.156. So if Trek tells you three times you've got fiduciary duties, you got it. All right? And I just took the Legal 2 instructors course the other day, and guess what? We didn't stress that enough to the instructors. And I didn't say a word about it, but I wanted to scream about it because this is, this is cornerstone foundation. Look at C. You've got an affirmative duty to keep the principal informed of all significant information. Okay? So if you go to the TREC website, pull down those rules and print them out and read them. That's what I would suggest. All right. Tied into the Occupations Code, you can lose your license for acting negligently and competently, dishonest bad faith, and of course, not talking about known defects. Now, what's a known defect? Actual knowledge so far. Now, let's talk about disclosure for a minute in Farm and Ranch. The Property Code says, as one of the exceptions, other than the fact that the federal government and banks don't have, to, don't have to disclose anything, which is totally unfair if y'all have ever dealt with them. But it says that you don't have to fill out a disclosure notice on a residential house on a farm and ranch if the house is worth 5% or less of the total value of the property. Okay? But I'm of the belief that you want to at least advise your client to disclose everything they know about all defects because you want them to keep their money when they sell the deal, Right? To me, that's important. And many times, these higher-priced pieces of land may not, the, the, the improvement may not reach that 5% level. But you want to advise your client, I think, to do that. That's one of my opinions about that. So that's one of the ways, I think, in the disclosure notice you might could avoid that. But I'm not telling you to avoid that. Please understand. Actual knowledge of a de defect is still the standard. But the TREC rules could be interpreted as constructive knowledge. That means if you're a professional and you should have known about something, then the law says you actually knew about it, therefore you're liable. But so far, knock on wood, in all the cases I've testified in and all that I've read, we're still held to the actual knowledge standard. We have to prove we didn't have actual knowledge about that defect. But if I walk into that farmhouse and the ceiling's caving in and the seller hadn't told somebody about it, I probably have actual knowledge, right? Jane Cohen, a uh, chair at UT Law School, and I teach in our class now and then, and she and I have done some conference together. She says, just like I say, the, the definition of scrupulous and meticulous under our fidelity obligation, I think, gives us constructive knowledge duties. But I don't want to let that out very loud because nobody, other lawyers don't need to know about that. But let's think about what we really offer the client. And that's what you're here for is to learn about what farm and ranch practices. What do we really offer the client? We don't offer them expertise in the way you do a transaction. That's, that can be done. We can help them with that. But we have expertise in the characteristics of the local market, right? That's what we offer the dentist from Dallas coming to Ozone. That's what we offer to the Chicago, Chicago Board of Trade guy that wants to write $30 million in a check for a ranch down there in South Texas. That's what we offer. That's what we need to think about. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the marketplace. And I want to, I want to really, some of you have been there. I want to, want to go ahead and announce this to you. The Texas Real Estate Center is having their 28th annual Outlook for Texas Land Markets, April 26th to 28th in San Antonio, where they normally have it. 
It's 250 bucks if you sign up on the web, 270 bucks if you go to the door. If you pay another 20 bucks, you get they will offer you the legal one for our certification course also. Charlie Gilliland, uh, Jim Gaines, all those folks talk about it. And Charlie is absolutely great. I was going to show you. This is a book that Charlie Gilliland wrote a few years ago. Uh, a m asked me to be the manuscript reviewer before he wrote this book. In other words, when you send a book to a, a manager to a publishing company, they ask experts to analyze it and recommend the publisher or not. Well, the kind of guy Charlie Gilliland, he has a Ph.D. in agricultural economics. I'm, he, I don't think he'd ever done a real estate deal as a broker, so I had some real suggestions. I'm different as a manuscript reviewer. Most of them hide behind anonymity. I just give them my name right off the bat. Okay. He modified this book to fit some of the brokerage practices, and the kind of guy he is, he came up all the way from A&M just specifically to buy me lunch and thank me for doing it. It's a great book called Buying Rural Land in Texas by Charles Gilliland. If I was a broker representing buyers from other parts of the country, I'd give them this book. I'd also give them my book called Sharing the Common Pool, Water Rights in, Every, in the Everyday Lives of Texans to understand about water rights. Because where does land get its most value? Land with water has value. Land without water has a lot less value, right? So I, I want to tout that. Well, Charlie's the one that will, put the, will probably be one of the main speakers at the outlook for Texas markets. Now, there's no real MLS system for farm and ranch properties. I'll show you some things. I'm a member of the San Antonio board also. They have some comps. A lot of it's done off and away from MLS. There's a lot of privacy in those transactions. And each tract is very, very unique and very, very complex. So if you're going to do some kind of competitive market analysis, you've got to be careful with it and understand that you're What's the big thing to do in these things? It's true comps, right? I hate the word apple, the phrase apples to apples and oranges to oranges, but that's what you try to do. They're really complicated. And I just printed out, put in some categories in the MLS system of the San Antonio Board of Realtors the other day, and I, I searched for last year in different counties where the mineral rights conveyed, what water was there, and their price is all over the board, you know, from... $3,000 an acre to one that each shouldn't even count, $47,000 an acre. That's an anomaly. I actually went into there, started to have, started to put in some other things where they calculate the price per acre and it was all screwed up. It didn't even relate. So you have to kind of do this yourself. But the bottom line, you know, you're looking at some of these down there, even the larger, you know, 100, uh, 500 acre tracks sold $3,438 an acre in Bandera with all minerals. Some of you that have practiced farm and ranch for a long time know it's hard to get these comps, right? But it's something I think we've got a duty to do with our people, and we've got to be able to treat people fairly in that regard. Now, you see all kinds of things. You see this one in Kerrville is 2.295 million, just six acres, okay? I mean, it just it's hard to tell. You've got these fancy booklets that absolutely amaze me for the amount uh, I've heard that in, around Weimar, Texas, which is a nice place, uh, got friends there that, you know, some of the land's been selling at $17,000 an acre for little 100-acre tracks. That's just pasture land. Who knows? Y'all may have experienced all kinds of prices. It's going to be unique to the area. Now, this is Charlie's report at the Texas Alliance of Land Brokers, of which I'm a member, back in June, and it shows a nominal price, how the price has gone up, then, an, then a, an adjustment for the way the money's changed through the years. That's across the whole state, so it doesn't look like it's gone up as much. In the Austin Waco Hill Country region, you can see by that some interesting prices. Um, I've actually been involved in a case down in the Hebronville area, uh, down a little bit back toward Laredo to the to the west, down close to the Rio Grande, but not without without frontage on without frontage on the Rio Grande. Where somebody bought five thousand acres, paid twenty five hundred bucks an acre, and there's just one old house built in nineteen fifty on it. Now he filed a lawsuit <laughs> because he didn't like what he'd bought. I think he thought he'd overpaid, so he sued the seller, 
who happened to be a high-tech fellow around here, uh, because the fella didn't disclose to him that one creek that ran through the property, hundreds of feet away from the house, was in a flood zone around here. So we won because there were no damages. But they actually filed a lawsuit and fought it for three years. But prices are, are, are what they are, you know. And, and I think that, that if you look at the Real Estate Center, you look at Charlie's presentations, if you're going to be in this business, I strongly advise that you go to some of his speeches that are around the state. Now, forgive me for being an academic, but I want to talk a little about the definition of fair market value, okay? And I've done this about water, but it's the same definition of fair market value. Okay, our old definition is what a willing buyer and willing seller will agree to a price without being under duress. As far as water valuation, I've written an article for UT Law School about that in the state bar. We're always under duress on water, so you can't, those comps are no good anyway. But look at what Brueggemann and Fisher say of SMU. The most probable price a property should bring in a competitive and open market under all conditions requisite to a fair sale. There's a lot of subjective terms there, right? Okay. And the buyer and seller acting prudently and knowledgeably and assuming the price is not affected by undue stimulus, that's their way of saying duress. Okay. Um, why do I give you this fair market value definition? Because I think it's important Again, what are our clients looking for when they come into the area you're in the farm and ranch business? They want to understand the marketplace. They want to understand they're getting a fair deal. They want to understand what's a fair offer. Your seller wants to know what's a reasonable price. He can, they can ask. You know, and sometimes they ask completely unreasonable prices, totally unreasonable prices. And it's, I think it's incumbent on us then to say, well, that price might be available in 2025, you know. But I think it's incumbent on us to tell the truth about it and understand the marketplace in that way. Now, another further def definition of that is assuming that buyer and seller are typically motivated. Well, if you're going through a foreclosure, there's no typical motivation. There's, there's no, there, there, there's, there's someone under duress. In farm and ranch, rarely are both parties well informed and well advised. Some of you have been in the business I know are very good, and you're well advising your clients. Others that have never been in it, it's different. The, the neat thing about the way we changed the rules a few years ago under 535.2, which has always said that a broker is responsible for the actions of their sales agents they sponsor, I'm <coughs> paraphrasing, but they don't have a duty to directly supervise, which I've always had trouble with. You better supervise them. But now at least we can restrict our agents underneath us to certain areas of practice that we can't allow them to have. I've testified in several trials where someone sponsored a builder and the builder wanted to have a sales license to, I guess, fool around with commissions, I don't know. And all of a sudden the house floods. There's nothing to do with the brokerage transaction, but because the broker sponsored that agent, the broker got sued because at that time before this, he didn't restrict that agent from doing certain business. I don't want an agent doing commercial work if they've never done commercial work. I don't want an agent under me doing farm and ranch work if they've never done farm and ranch work. Okay, now you can restrict that and take a little bit of the burden off us as brokers. I'm not saying you're bad if you sponsor agents. Please don't get me wrong. I just say as I've gotten older, I'm a lot more careful about these kind of things. And I want you to understand no matter how many times you put a limited liability company together and all that, whoever is that corporate agent that sponsored that, that license, that you pay, what, 150 bucks, 100 bucks for to get a corporate license, you're still going to all pass over to you if that agent does something wrong. So think about that. So well-informed and well-advised, you hope people act in their best interests. A reasonable time is allowed for exposure using American dollars. And it's not affected by any special creative financing. Now, the last few years, since 2007, when we had pathetic alternate investments, Maybe that's why a lot of money's come into farm and ranch, okay? And so you think that maybe there hadn't been a lot of creative financing out there. I think we all learned our lesson, maybe somewhat in the 80s, uh, maybe not. Time is of the essence for the parties and the brokers, period. Don't let anybody kid you. Time is of the essence. And luckily, we've changed the farm and ranch contract to make that very clear in some places we're going to talk about in a minute. Now... I just pulled some samples here and there 
the Silver Rings Ranch. This is one of Rick Doak on Rick Doak's website. Um, it's under contract or sold for $6,762 an acre. Uh, it's out around Fredericksburg. It looks like it's got looks like it's got some water frontage there. I think he tells the truth about that. Don't put a sign. Don't put a picture on a piece of property you're listing that shows it on the water when it's not on the water, right? What's the worst thing around here? I, I remember the first time I served on the board of directors here before I was chairman at the Austin board. One of our directors came in back when everybody advertised in the newspaper. She had looked at the Sunday newspaper. She had one page of the want ads. 75% of every one of those want ads misrepresented water frontage up on Lake Travis. It was beyond belief. People said it's waterfront. Well, you walk down the street around the corner and through this easement to somebody else's beach or common beach. You know, waterfront to me means I walk out in my underwear and step in the water, right? But we misrepresent it everywhere. So be careful. I mean, people are, lawyers are out there, even though with tort reform and things, things have changed a lot. They're out there like lions on the prowl looking for these kind of cases because people don't want to take responsibility for bad decisions. You know, I've seen a lot of people come from my piece that, man, it's great, I'm going to buy this big ranch in Texas. I've seen the John Wayne movies. This looks cool. And both them and their wives come down and say, this is a hell of a place to be in August. Every single bush has got a, has got a point on it that's going to attack you. They're rattlesnakes. They're coral snakes. They're feral hogs that kill my dogs and tear up my yard. This isn't the nirvana I thought it would be, right? And so I think people look for them for reasons, especially the wealthy people that pay these three and five million dollar prices or more. You know, they look for a way to come back and guess who they hit first? Because we got Arizona emissions coverage. And I'll say something about Arizona emissions coverage right now. Okay? You better be careful who you're who's the insurance company underwriting. If they're in some state that requires a very small reserve, don't think you're covered for a million bucks, okay? I'll tell you, I do, I've done, I guess of the 600 cases, now I'm over about 65% defense over the 30 years. One of the things that frustrates me the most are the largest insurers when I'm defending somebody, the insurance company pays me my fee, they'll be six months behind paying me. They'll be nine months behind paying their lawyers. Yet we're trying to defend a claim against one of their clients where they got a million dollar liability. That's insane. I won't tell you the name of the insurance companies. You know what I do now? You're going to pay me my retainer by wire transfer you put before you put my name in that case. I don't need the business. I don't want the trouble. The moment your name is an expert, there's a ticking time bomb that's lit in your schedule. I didn't go on vacation for 10 years. I couldn't go anywhere more than a few days because I had to come back for something somewhere else. I'm not complaining. God was good to me. But it's amazing how you better be careful in the Arizona mission coverage. I really mean that. Don't get the cheapest. Some of you have already learned in your life when you buy insurance, don't get that cheapest insurance. Because what do you want? You want to pay a claim, right? Anyhow, that's an aside. Y'all know about the Wagner Ranch deal? You know, $725 million plus. Unbelievable. Um, Sam Middleton did it with a guy from Australia named Bernie Ulrich or something. Uh, the Wagner family, apparently, heirs have been fighting over it for a long time, and one guy walked in from San Diego and wrote a check for over $700 million. Pretty nice deal. The way <laughs> I spoke and gave a presentation about an article I wrote about the history of the groundwater district bill that Charlie asked me to write, speak at one of the land conferences in San Antonio, and these guys got up and spoke to the audience right after me, and the guy from Australia said that Sam Middleton was the stake, and he and the Australian guy was the sizzle. Man, they sure talked a lot about that deal. Well, I guess you could, about $725 million. Lake Creek Ranch, notice there's water on it, $8,700 an acre. That's an asking price. And you can see these prices all across the board everywhere you look, as you all well know. So, you know, this group right here, Texas Alliance of Land Brokers, is one of the better groups if you're going to be in our business. I'm a member. Others of your members, I would strongly advise you to join. We have pretty much monthly luncheons. We have speakers that come and talk at those luncheons. Uh, the food's good where we go. Usually it's in Stonewall or other parts of the hill country. And I tell you, if you're going to be in this business, if you want to be in the farm and ranch business, get into this group. Uh, I'm real proud to be a member of it. I got in the group about a year ago after they asked me to speak at a luncheon. 
and I got to know everybody there. Um, and one thing led to another, and I got them in the education business. Uh, I wrote a course about water rights. It's a certification course with Jason Hill, I may have mentioned. And I think they're a great group. And they're, they're, they focus on farm and ranch transactions, period. All right. The T-bill. Ten-year T-bill. A little economics. I'm not Mark Dotzer. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure not. T-bill this morning was $2.749 2 at 9.56 this morning. Why is that important? Okay. Because... The best indication of the most safe, risk-free investment in the world is the 10-year T-bill. Okay? Been that way my whole life. In other words, why would I want to invest my money in anything if it doesn't get more than the T-bill? I can sit on my butt at home and at least be assured, unless the United States government goes away, I'm going to get that much. It had been suppressed down into the ones. And that's the basic rate where why CD rates have been half percent or less, right? And we have held down the rate. I'm, somebody said this thing is kind of cool, like holding a beach ball underwater. When that rate lifts up, that ball's going to pop up. Those that you were alive when Richard Milhouse, Tricky Dick Nixon was president, had wage and price controls, what happened after that? Time Magazine showed under Jimmy Carter, the jaws sharp on the front page. Inflation was 18%. You know? So that popped back up. How will this affect farm and ranch real estate? Well, I don't know. If I can get 7% on my CDs and be 100% protected by the FDIC and spread it like Ovita Culp Hobby used to do when it was $100,000 in the 70s, she had one staff of people that did nothing but put $100,000 in every new savings loan and bank across the country. That's how much money she had because it's protected. As you get older, you want to protect your money more. But you watch this T-bill rate. That's why the RETs, RETs, RETs have been bailing out. Sam Zell sold an office building right across this area down here on, three, on a 360 at a 4% cap rate. Somebody bought it at that. That adjusted to a very high price on the net operating income, right? Well, now this has moved up to 2.8. That cap rate to value that building is probably like at about a 7. That means you ever bought that building? sees that value of that building drop by 20 or 30 percent, and they did nothing wrong. They got the same tenants and things. So watch this rate. If it goes back where it should be at 3 or 4 percent, you're going to see the banks compete for CDs at 6 or 7 percent again. Then again, if I'm that dentist from Dallas, do I want to put $30 million in a farm and ranch at these high prices? Maybe not. For what it's worth, that's only an opinion. That is not scientific fact. All right, contracts and revisions. Now, this is where you're going to hear my opinion. As a practitioner and having bought many, many properties for myself and been involved as, a, as an agent in, I think, well over 1,000 times in 40 years, the first thing I'll tell you is to consult an attorney. There's a common phrase in all our promulgated forms it says one thing, consult an attorney. Now, a lot of y'all are adverse to attorneys. Every single piece of property I ever bought, sold, or dealt with, pretty much even as a broker, I've always had an attorney on my team. Now, I don't bring a downtown Houston attorney to Ozone. <laughs> but part of the things I do is I understand that legal culture. And I've testified enough all around this state that there is a different legal culture in every, every community. Okay. I think you've got to consult an attorney. I've never seen an attorney that was a hindrance to my deals. One did one time when I was real young, wanted to take over the deal, and I fired him instantly. But I've had Brad Bracewell, Tim Taylor, Jackson Walker, Jim Nice, I can name a bunch of them, that have been great support in that team. My opinion, consult an attorney. Here's where I get into things that you're going to find different. Have an attorney add a feasibility period of free look and try to negotiate that it does not begin until all documents are received. Be like we are in Austin at commercial property. Long ago, you don't have a time frame on your feasibility period in Austin this space on an event. That event is not getting zoning approval. That event is getting site development plan approval. It takes two years to lay bail's attention. It's not based on a time frame, it's an event. 
So that event, what good does a two-week time frame do you if you get all your documents on the 13th day? You can't adjust to it. But people do that all the time. Now, can you negotiate a deal like that? It's hard to do sometimes. But if you've got a client that's buying an $8 million piece of property out there, I think it's something you ought to recommend to that client to do. Okay? You want to get the title commitment. You want to get copies of every single document on Schedule B, which are the exceptions. Now, you're not an attorney. You're not interpreting those documents. But even the Legal One new course instruction booklet says you need to read that title commitment, okay? And find out about that title. I can tell you stories where I didn't read the title commitment when I was 29 years old, and it bit me, okay? Bit my surveyor. I also think you ought to get a new survey. You hear me say to hell with T-47s. On farm and ranch, don't, let, don't, invite, don't allow T-47 to happen. The client might want it, but get yourself out of that loop. I, I don't take a T-47 on a lot and block in Austin, Texas because of encroachments and things that change. And surveys are expensive. I want to see, a, I want to see all lease files and all correspondence in those files and all, every course, all the correspondence from the county president. I don't want to just go to their website. I want to go to the, under the Public Information Act and get everything on that property from the county website. Because what may happen is they've gone and had some reductions, and you'll have those notes that they made with the appraiser, and all of a sudden, what they're telling you is perfect. Well, it really wasn't perfect when they went and testified with that county appraiser. It's where people think that that's not there. People think that the appraisal districts won't sue them, but they sure will. whole guilt deal is to help your buyer assess his or her risks. The same thing goes for your seller. You got a seller who's inherited a big old ranch somewhere out in South Texas. They don't, they've never been a rancher. They've enjoyed going out there and putting on boots and riding around. You need to help them understand their risk because that's the value we add to the deal. That's how we're professionals. Okay? So you've heard me say base the look period on an event. And the termination option on paragraph 23 compla contemplates a time frame. You cannot change that unless you're a licensed attorney. I'm sorry to frustrate you. Now, I've had people come at me before and say, Dr. Porter, you're telling me not to use this contract? No, I'm not telling you. I'm telling you the problems with that contract. I know for a fact this promulgated contract was used in a transaction that was high eight figures. Because people out of another part of the world that was a trust account, trust department, wanted to force that contract to be used because of Texas law, which is good. But it complicated things for the attorneys on the buy side because there are like 14 different pieces of track, all some conject, some contingent, some adjust, some together, and some not. Okay? So I'm not knocking the form. I think you have to be careful with it. You may not want to even do this event thing versus a time frame. I always have asked it for 40 years and Usually, I get it approved. Makes them get me that information quickly. If they don't want to give me that information, I walk many times. That's me personally. That's my opinion. That's not going to have to be yours, okay? I understand opportunity costs. What's that? In my first degree in finance, they didn't talk about opportunity costs at the University of Texas in the 70s. He said, leverage yourself as much as you can. But what they didn't tell us is, what's opportunity cost? It's when you invest in something and you lose the opportunity to use that money for something else. In our time as brokers, how many times you busted your butt? I worked on the front of Johnny Creek for seven years. Okay? I worked in Waxhatchee on a big track at I-35 and 287 for five years. I ain't going on and on. I didn't get paid a nickel on the one in Waxhatchee. Because the market changed in October 2007 because the family was arguing. Okay? So you need to be careful about the opportunity cost of your time. I'm sorry to be fired up about that, but you want to get adequate time to walk the property before and after. All right? And remember what you do. Please shut the gate when you walk through it. I mean, you can't imagine how many people don't do that. Okay? I think promulgated farms are risky for large transactions. What's a large transaction? Who knows? And I will tell you right now, the form we're going to look at in a minute is very, 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 very weak on water rights. Tremendously weak, and I'll tell you why. And I think you ought to include a kill date on your offer. 
Most you can put, I guess you could, I've heard all kinds of opinion. Can you put a kill date on the offer in the special provisions? In other words, this offer is good till Friday Central Standard Time, 5 o'clock p.m. I want to create urgency in that buyer or seller. I want to create urgency. I don't want to have an open offer out there. Ron Walker used to tell me, well, Charles, you can always withdraw that offer at any time. Yeah, but I don't want to worry about that. I've never bought a single piece of property that didn't have a kill date in the offer. I don't want out, uh, outstanding offers out there. But they put us in this position because there's not that in the promulgated forms and some of the TR forms there's a kill date. Okay? Put us in the position that we might be accused of practicing law. We shouldn't be doing that. All right, here's the new farm and ranch contract. I'm just going to hit the highlights. I don't want to spend, we've already been, it's already been an hour and 10 minutes. I've got a lot more to do. First of all, if you're an agent, your first source to find out about this contract is your broker. If you're a broker, your first source is not Porter or Gordon Gritzka. Your first source is your lawyer. Okay? Because we're not supposed to practice law. But I'll hit the highlights. Number one, put it in red. Nobody thinks about authority. All these classes we take never talk about authority unless you take my class. Who has authority to buy and sell? And a lot of these big ranches are all fragmented between brothers and sisters that really love each other, but they have different interests now. They hate each other over the ranch. I can go over 10, I can name them to, I can tell you some really fun stories about it where I've gotten in the middle of it. You know, remember when you used to buy something in corporate name, you had to have a corporate resolution before you signed that document, right? So authority is important. You know, don't assume authority if you're, if a, 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 a man and woman that are married are selling because you need to find out what if they're under divorce, in a divorce. Who has authority then? Don't get yourself where you're wasting your time on some kind of deal because you don't know if they've got authority to sign, both seller and buyer. To me, that's really important. We overlook it. The other circle I've got there about the land, how you describe it. Well, the one I'd put in there is C Exhibit A. That'd be the field notes and the survey attachment and a proper description of the property. And don't allow the property to have the first starting corner be a pine tree that was in 1905. <laughs> you know, a lot of surveyors use that. And in fact, we'll talk about surveys in a minute. You know, you can. Use, I have a collection of, of 18th century surveys that always show a little house and show the tree where it started. That doesn't work, folks. I think that's pretty risky. All right. Now, the rest of that, if you see under there where it talks about with all rights, privileges, and pertinences pertaining to under property but not limited to, blah, 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 that's the Mother Hubbard Clause. Trying to catch everything. We don't have time to talk about it, but there's a better Mother, Hub Mother Hubbard Clause. But I know the pressure that the broker lawyer committee is on. They want a shorter form contract, but we gripe about it being too many pages, and they want to try to limit it as much as possible. I disagree with that. I don't care if this contract's 50 pages. I want it to hire a bigger font so people can read it at my age. But nonetheless, what it, for what it's worth. Okay, the good news is look at where it says reservation. You used to say put the reservation in special provisions. Thank goodness we cut that silliness out because that's practicing law. Okay? But guess what it says? In accordance with an attached addendum. There's only one addendum we can use, reservation of mineral rights. What about water? What about timber? All, I'm going to propose <laughs> an addendum. I'm going to have to get, just like when I did, started the process on House Bill 1221 to add the line about groundwater districts to the property code. I started buying 10 or 12 lawyers lunch and breakfast at the Austin Club for a year to get them to write that sentence. Well, I didn't mind. I was offered money. I turned it down because I was on TR committees. But when I walked in front of the legislature and I had 200,000 members of the of TAG, TAR, Austin Board, Texas DSAL, and Texas Water Conservation Association, they didn't ask any questions to that. You know, that's what it takes in our system. My next thing to do is to try to get those addendum written, and the next thing, we need to have a paragraph in this contract about water. Hell, we got a paragraph about propane, right? We got a place where it says if you're an agricultural development district. Well, guess what? There's never been an agricultural development district yet, but you've got to check yes or no. But we have for, we, we passed the Groundwater Conservation District Act in 1949. Okay? 
and we have never had any mandatory disclosures, I've already said in front of many speeches, it would not have passed had it been called the Groundwater Re Regulation Act. But believe me, if you're in a groundwater conservation district and you violate those rules, you're looking at 5,000 bucks a day if they've got the money to even send somebody to enforce it, which we'll talk about. But anyhow, I think that you're going to see more and more par people reserving their water. And we don't have an addendum for that. That's why you need an attorney. Earnest money. Yeah, you can have a deal without somebody paying the earnest money or consideration, which I just hate. I was taught at UT, you know, you don't have a contract, you just got consideration. I promise to pay consideration, which is a bad legal concept. As far as I'm concerned, this deal's dead after, well, like now, luckily, after three days. If that earnest money is not up, the deal's dead. Period. I always make sure my clients understand the effective date of the contract and they agree to it, and I'm not doing a thing. It all comes to title company at the same time with earnest money check or I won't do it. When we did the Delano tract out here, I was lucky enough to be the broker through all kinds of buyers and sales in that deal. We wanted to convince the trustees of the Delano, that's where Trader Joe's is out here at BK's Road, that 33 acres, just on the other property on the camp, maybe it's worth real value in this town. We put $250,000 in earnest money up at the title company on an escrow agreement before we negotiated the price. So I wanted to show that we were serious. And I had a big client called American Retirement Corporation that wanted the property that bad. But we proved to the trustees when somebody had screwed around with them for two years, it's time for another extension. They turned down the extension and took our deal. Earnest money needs to get in the title company immediately. Don't count on somebody. Okay, it's Friday. Well, he'll deliver it on Monday. Get it there. I wish the law would change about that. It's not going to. There's a better way here. At least it says now time is of the essence. You've got three days to put the earnest money in. Back to water. This is our mineral. I'll talk some more about this in a minute. The mineral state does not include water. So that mineral reservation form in the about water, right? It doesn't include water, yet they can use the water. All right. I think you ought to always advise your client to pay the extra, what is it, 15% of the basic rate on the title policy to delete the area and boundaries exception in the title policy. Y'all know what that is, right? Title company insure the property, but they ain't going to insure areas, shortages in areas, and boundary exactly. I learned that a long time ago in Houston, Texas, buying property on Augusta and Bering Drives where we're paying $27 a foot. That foot made a, that's a difference when you've got two, three acre tract, you know? Got enough problems as it is in most of these old subdivisions. You got different surveys tying into different benchmarks in the street. I can tell you a story, story. That means there's a musical chair out there somewhere on Augustine Bearing where there's a foot missing somewhere that's gonna come about. Now that property's worth $100 a square foot, okay? So I think you ought to delete the errors and the sections, and it takes a certain kind of survey, but you can do that with the title company. Um, many of y'all probably already done that. Okay? I think you ought to get a new survey. If you use it, your client uses the T47 certificate, it allows the old survey, understand what that says. It says, to the best of their knowledge, the seller doesn't think anything's happened since then. When I got back to Austin, Texas, started doing brokers, I was so shocked that the buyer normally bought a survey on residential. I just, in Houston, the culture was you always had a survey. You know, I don't want to represent somebody as a seller and so I've got a current survey. Why? Because I want to know what I'm selling. You know, and surveys are expensive and surveys are frustrating when it's busy, right? Hard to get a survey out there. So that's my opinion about T47. Remember this, if you look at it, it says prior to the execution of the contract, sellers provide a buyer with these copies of these exception documents, and you don't get to object to them if they're put there. Let your buyer understand, for you, they're going to give you documents beforehand. You're basically given approval if you don't, if you let's list them there. I don't think that's right either. Different leases. There's the Agricultural Development District. How do you find out if there's one that slipped in since the last time you looked at this? You go to the Agricultural Code, put in Agricultural <coughs> Development District, you'll say no. What was an Agricultural Development District? At one time it was set up where you could have a local district that allowed the state to help you issue bonds to develop agriculture there. And 
It never was going to work if farmers two independents work together like that. They may already be in a co-op as it was. But none of them want to have that agricultural district go in and, and have any bonded indebtedness. Notice the water level fluctuation. That's about big lakes. Okay. Here's the big bugaboo. Who pays for rollback taxes? And that gets into a big argument. I won't have time today to do it, but you can go to certain appraisal district sites and they'll tell you how they calculate the rollback. And that five-year rollback can bite you pretty bad real quick if you lose that ag valuation. Please never say agriculture exemption because we're not exempt from paying taxes. Even though in Kerr County, you can, if you have ag valuation, you can re basically reduce your tax, average tax by 97%. That's another reason people buy farm and ranch, right? But if you screw up or that appraisal district decides to declare war on you and you're not really in the agribusiness, that five-year rollback can sting you real, real quick, real quick. So it's something to consider. And of course, the termination option is fine for residential properties. It's okay for a simple farm and ranch. I'm scared about it. And where it says here for nominal consideration, I'm going to try to, I'm selling it. $10 million piece of property, I'm going to take $100 for the option fee. Uh -uh. <laughs> I ain't going to do it. Because I'm missing the opportunity for that to be seen by some other dentist from Dallas who thinks they want to buy a ranch in Hebronville. Okay. Consult an attorney. There it is again. Y'all are tired of hearing that. Here's what I think needs to be added to this contract. And I've been advised not to go through the broker lawyer committee, but run it through the legislature. Two water rights addendums, one for groundwater and one for surface water, if you're going to reserve them. Here's one problem that's coming up. I'm scooping myself later. I'll remember not to talk about it. If you sell a track, a portion of a track that has an appropriate right to use surface water for irrigation, and you sell a part of that track, say half of it, to somebody else, whether it's on the water or not, TCEQ says that, that if you had 100 acre feet of water right, and the permit says that half that goes with that other track. Even though they don't have access to the water, they're not close to the river. So that's why this contract's kind of funky there. You need to be sure it's already a lawsuit. The sellers should have realized, and their lawyers should have picked up on it, we're going to reserve all those water rights here. We're just selling you the surface over here. We need some addendums for that. You can't use the promulgated contract for this. We need a kill date. Above all else, we need a con an, an article, a, 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 a paragraph about groundwater districts. I think we need more lines in the top of the contract for describing who owns the property, and I want to see it in a bigger font, but that's, that's probably never going to happen. Um, all right, surveys and easements. I advise survey each time. I've told you that too many times. And I advise buyers and sellers to try to make any easement to an express, a pertinent, filed or record easement. I don't want implied easements. I don't want oral easements. I don't want any of that kind of stuff in the modern times. I don't, want the, I don't care if great-grandpa made a deal with Billy Pete's great-grandpa. Let's get it in writing. Okay? Absolutely. Now, will I buy a property with an oral easement? Maybe. But you can sure tell those easements, right? When you walk the land, if you've done it right, you see an odd gate somewhere, and you see two, two, two lines in the dirt where they've been driving across the property. You look at the survey, you look at the Schedule, schedule B in it doesn't have it, right? So you need to ask questions about that. That may be critical to you someday. Um, anyhow, surveys and easements. What's a survey? Y'all can read that as well as I can. What comes first? Title commitment or the survey? Title commitment. So you better get that, make sure that surveyor goes and gets that title commitment. Most surveyors do it. But I learned my lesson at 27 years old when one didn't do it. I won't tell you the story about that. I bought my way out of it, but it was a nightmare. Also, I want them to plot where that floodplain line is on the survey, not just in the cartouche or the key. If there's a flood zone, I want them to draw it across the survey. I want to have a visual representation of where that line is. And then I want to be able to have enough sense to check the elevation. <coughs> I sold a expensive house up on Lake Travis from some friends of mine. I made them work six months before we sold it because it was a family thing for 30 years. We sold it. 
had a new survey done. They didn't gripe out there from Houston. They understand that system. And the surveyor had the house in the middle of Lake Travis because he screwed the elevations up. Well, I'm not a surveyor, but at least I had enough sense to know that that couldn't be that way. Made a mistake on his CAD drawings. So, advise your client to get an accurate survey. Don't accept a tree as a corner monument. Forget the T-47. Now, I always talk about fences here. Everybody thinks they know a lot about fences. If you're going to be in our business, you need to read the Texas Agricultural Code, period. You don't have to be a lawyer. Just like if you'd read the Occupation Code, read the Agricultural Code. We go to great lengths with support of the capital to make this wording understandable. We had to change the Occupation Code this last session. I didn't even know about it. Didn't even have to. The legislature, the council, changed some wording of some things, little stuff. But read the Agricultural Code. Talks about sufficient, it talks about sufficient fences, okay? Gates. How many gates you've got to have? Open range versus closed range. We'll talk about that in a minute. Don't try to read all that. It's just giving you an idea. Those guidelines are there, right? Now, if you're walking the property and you see some odd-looking fence, you kind of really impress your buyer if you kind of understand this stuff, you know? What can you do about it? Not much, but it helps to think about it and understand it because there are guidelines about fences. You can have a boundary agreement, okay? Fences don't establish property lines, surveys, and legals do. All around my area, down around floors where I've got my place, there's sometimes two or three fences stacked up and they against each other. You know, different people put different fences here and there. So it could create a strip, could create a gore. That's where there are things that are outside the boundaries. You've got to be aware of that. You've got to have formal boundary agreements where people have agreed to things. You've got to work that out. And anyhow, I won't get into this, don't have time, but you could have a boundary agreement with somebody. I would advise you to get that boundary agreement in writing and adjust your survey accordingly or figure out some way. If somebody's taking 30 feet of your property in a boundary agreement, maybe they ought to pay for that 30 feet. <laughs> At least that 30 feet from you, unless you're just, you know, uh, unless I guess you feel that they're a charity case, you want to give it to them. Livestock and fencing. Open range. That means in Texas, we assume that all areas are open range. Okay? That means if I want to keep the cattle off my property, it's my duty to fence it and keep the cattle off. Okay? And I started studying with my interns to write another article about open range, closed range in Texas. And guess what? It didn't, it, there's a different rule in each county if they know they're open range or closed range. Most don't. There's no place to go for it. You can have open range for horses and not for cattle in the same county. Open range for goats and sheep and not for cattle. Judon Fambro, when I talked to him about it, said, you're about to write the longest article you've ever written in your life because every county's different. And some counties aren't allowed to have anything but open range. What's the big difference? If it's a closed range county and they've had an election, and when you call the county clerk, they won't, most of them won't know unless the election was recent. If it's closed range, and I gotta keep my horses and cattle on my property, it's my responsibility. If they get out on the highway in a closed range county and get hit, then it's my responsibility it could be a class C misdemeanor. In that little five question article I wrote several years ago in TAR Magazine, that one, question came in, and I advised him to call the agriculture department. And I really thought, I talked to somebody there, they had to get help me out. He called him <laughs> that article, and the agriculture said, we don't know. He called his county clerk, don't know. He called the agriculture extension, didn't know. We got 254 counties, folks. Open closed range is important to consider. We're mostly an open range state. When I asked about it in Wilson County when I first bought my place, they didn't have an answer. So they quickly tried to have an a, a election about it. Well, the first election was closed range. Then somebody threw the election out because they didn't do it right. Came back and did it again a year later and it's closed range. So I keep my place fenced because I don't want people. Think about it. If you're growing a crop of corn, it takes you, what, several weeks to get that corn in. You work your butt off if you ride the tractor yourself like I do. And here comes somebody's horses and goats and stalk your corn down just about the time, you know, you're ready to make some money from it. So... Anyhow, this is kind of the ugly part of farms and ranching, right? All right. Again, there are some little 
oddities in the law. I'm not a lawyer. Here's that old actual knowledge idea again. If you didn't know your cow was out on the street and you had it hit, then you might not be held responsible. Of course, you can't count on that. You know, if you don't, if you got a bunch of, if you got buffalo on your place, you probably all go down and see if they're busting the fences down, because they tend to like to bust fences. All that's something to think about. All right. Abbott said it's mostly open range. 21 counties weren't allowed the option, and that goes back into the 19th century. If you're a farmer and want livestock, build you a fence, okay, and make it a good fence. All this cut that I've got, even though my skin's getting thinner as it's getting older, comes from doing fixing barbed wire fence, and I just hate it, especially in August. But you got to do it. Okay, strays, you don't get to keep strays. Here it is in the code. You know what you're supposed to do if you see a stray in your place? Call the sheriff in your county. Have anybody ever done that? Good. I did it because my wife, I had some horses on my place. And since I've got my little friends on Cibolo Creek, it floods twice a year whether there's a drought or not, and people's horses ran on our place. I kind of liked them being there. You know, I kind of like to poop around my oak tree. <laughs> my wife couldn't stand it. She's pure Irish, and man, she's mean. So I didn't know what to do, so I called the sheriff. And thank God I did because it was his horses. <laughs> and I, I just bought that place, and I was considered a city boy. Okay, down in Wilson County. I'll tell you stories about that, too. But... I got to know the deputy sheriff real well, and we've been fast friends. He was a neighbor. It was his horse. He couldn't find him. He said, you're the first guy in my 37 years of being sheriff that called me about a stray. So there's the law. You don't get to keep them. All right. Easements. Write this down. Easements in Texas. Technical report number 42 by Judon Fambro in 2013. It was updated in 2013. It's a 22-page document. Doesn't take a long word to read it, but they're tremendously complicated, okay? I'm going to hit the highlights. It's enough complication, though, it's one very good reason you need to consult an attorney about easements, okay? Private easements. An easement in gross is one owned by a private individual or business entity. It doesn't stick to the land. It's just temporary. Public easements were like in your backyard at your house, you've got a utility easement, they can wander through all they want. One of the big nightmares we've had down in South Texas, and I was fortunate enough to help a friend of mine on a family that has 370,000 acres down there since 1890. They wanted to run a utility line through a power line right through the middle of it. Didn't want to go up the highway because they could cut off a little angle. And it would have screwed up the whole thing because I'm all for power transferred around the country, but the only way they keep that ranch is hunting. When you give that power easement for one of those giant power lines, then they can come maintain it when they want. And here you've got a bunch of hunters in there paying you $15,000 a gun, and here comes the guy driving through, honking his horn and drinking beer, whatever. So the only way we won that battle, luckily we had some Spanish Colonial historical wells there. We started just, took it to the Texas Historical Commission. Just the fact we applied Guess what? The power company went to Highway 1017. <laughs> Where it ought to be, not through our property. Had it been oil and gas, we'd still be in court. Only over money. So, anyhow, an appurtenant easement is one that attaches, like my arms appurtenant to my body, not adjacent to appurtenant, that attaches to the land. It needs to be expressed and filed a record, okay? Period. You're not a lawyer. If you see these implied or all these other strange easements I'm not going to talk about, you want to get your advisor client to get an attorney to make that easement public record and define that easement. It costs money, but it's important. I've been involved in several of those cases. What happens is, you know, what happens to our big ranch? They're fragmented through divorce, through inheritance, all those kind of things, and what used to be fun was not anymore. Prescriptive easement. That's an easement that's been there in time. It's like an, it's like an adverse possession. Okay, Porter, what's a prescriptive easement? Good example. Highway 130, the new 130 that goes that they're now having to tear up the road because of all the problems with the base. I don't know if you've driven it from Seguin to Austin. But you'll see areas where that highway is now draining off through people's property. If it stays there long enough, that's a prescriptive easement. Let's say all of a sudden, 30 years from now, your grandkids, that corner becomes... 
a retail or not to retail, retail's been gone. Jeff Diesel took that away. But some kind of commercial corner, you ain't going to be able to build them that easy. Okay. I used to represent Dr. Dick Cooley, one of his son in laws, was my partner for years. And he had bought a big piece of land next to Deerbrook Mall in, in Humble, Humble, Texas from Hallmark Development Company. It had a big prescription drainage easement through it, wasn't disclosed to him. And I went up and argued with Hallmark Development about that easement that wasn't disclosed to Dr. Cooley. The only reason we won that battle was because they were said, well, just sue us. I mean, these serious people were the meanest people I ever dealt with outside of railroads. I said, well, that's fine, but guess what? Half the judges in Harris County either had Dr. Cooley save their life with a heart surgery or somebody in their family just bring it to Harris County. And that was an arrogant thing to say. But we settled it out. They went and negotiated with the highway department. And they also gave us a sewer line. They wouldn't let us tap their sanitary sewer line, even though I had to pass it. They wanted us to force us to go under Highway 59 back to the plant, which would have made that property worthless. Dr. Cooley was too, too I, didn't, I wasn't the broker in that deal. He'd owned it 10 years. He was too, 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 uh, too trusting. But watch out for prescriptive easements. They've been there for a while. Easement by estoppel. If you had an oral agreement long enough, even if you've got a written agreement and you honor the way you're, you don't honor the written agreement, but you do something different than the written agreement, it's like everything else you do, you can be a stop from going back to the written agreement. So you got to be real careful. Where that hits you already, maybe it's your homeowner association. All of a sudden, the homeowner association start having meetings again, right? And it says you can't build a carport within 25 feet of the property line of the street. But they've allowed some people to do that in other areas. You can't go back and then force it on new folks. And that's shocking a lot of people around our community, especially in Travis country. Conservation easements. Great idea. But they're problems. It's like a friend of mine, Briscoe Center, has a great old family ranch that he's 75 years old. It was his great-grandfather's ranch. He wants to keep it together. And he said, you know, if I do this, what about if my grandkids need something someday? How do I sell it? What do I do? He didn't care about the tax aspects of it. I'm all for conservation easements. I like the groups involved. I'd like to put mine in a conservation easement. I don't want my kids to ever sell my land that's got a mile of frontage on that creek. I really don't. I built a two-story house with my own hands by myself except for electricity. I've plowed it, mowed it, done everything. But then again, what if my grandson Charles IV gets real sick in 10 years and I'm hopefully in heaven? What happens then with health care changes and things? So, you know, have to think about that. But, you know, y'all may be considered those things. Adverse possession, real quick. Judon wrote a great article, Use It or Lose It. Okay. Folks, adverse possession is one real key thing. You've got to hold it possibly, right? So get off your butt and go see property that you own somewhere. Don't ignore it, even if there's nothing on it. you got to run the trespassers off. I've testified in a lot of trials about that. Don't have time to talk about it. There's three-year and five-year. It means there was some kind of duly registered color of title that was involved. Ten- and 25-year deeds get to be kind of, years get to be kind of funny. You can have a 10-year adverse possession, and the main is 25 years. But sometimes... If you've got a problem with adverse possession that many years later, you can sue to protect yourself, right? But who do you sue? You've got to serve somebody with that lawsuit. And I did that on, it took me a year to do that on a case on adverse possession that had been claimed. <laughs> the title company wouldn't give this lady coverage to her 44 acres. It used to be an oil gas subdiv oil subdivision in 1905 because everybody had already died, but we had to sue somebody somewhere, and there were 45 other owners, squatters, dating to 1905. So you got to you know, just read Judon's article. Use it or lose it. Adverse possession doesn't happen a lot, but it can. Happens in Texas where somebody up in Massachusetts, you know, ends up inheriting some great uncle's piece of property, and then somebody's down there with a mobile home on it just moves on to it. All right. Flood issues post Harvey. Why is that important? Y'all all watch Harvey. I had my, luckily, all three of my kids and grand, and who have, I guess, now four grandkids, was they were out in the flood. They were in the memorial area, but somehow God blessed us not to be in the flood. It is pandemonium there. I wrote this article that's published back in Texas Realtor Magazine. I don't know if you read it or not. 
Uh, Gary Pate's a great lawyer friend of mine. In fact, we were, <laughs> we were against each other the case when I wrote this article. But it's all about navigating settlers and closures of post harvest. You gotta, most people in Texas now are becoming more aware. NAR is taking the position that our flood insurance program needs to be actuarially sound. Well, we were 18 billion in the hole with it before Harvey. I bet we'll be 38 billion in the hole after. I don't know where climate change is coming. I don't get to wear a sweater to Texas football games in the, in the, in the fall like I used to in the 60s. So maybe it's getting warmer. I don't care about that. As a Boy Scout, Eagle Scout from Troop 28 in Austin, you want to be prepared for the worst. But we're going to have more of these flood events. Subsidence. There's no impervious cover limitations here. I'm not for impervious cover limitations particularly. And think about what happens if we make flood insurance actually sound. Where will those premiums be? If you own a beach house down on Pirates Beach, guess who's paying your premium? State of Texas is. We're paying y'all's premium for that house because of the sign risk pool. You couldn't afford the insurance. Nobody will insure you. So think about flood insurance on even these ranch properties. And that's where the first time I, all the lawyers at TR agreed with me before I wrote that article that now if you're in that area of Texas, it's awful hard to say you didn't know about Harvey if you were an agent. That means you've got constructive knowledge about it, right? I mean, they're actually in my land building houses up six feet high even though it's flooded three times in three years. Don't you think that fl third flood in three years might be something maybe the owners should have thought about? <coughs> Why are they doing that in my land? Because they don't want to live in Katy and drive an hour and a half into town each way. But flood insurance is something more to think about, I think. Look at this one. This wasn't in the Houston Chronicle. This is in the Dallas Morning News. Front page. All those houses that flooded in the Barker Reservoir, Guess what the plaque said? This subdivision adjacent to the Barker Reservoir is subject to extended control and inundation under the management of the U.S. Corps of Engineers, Army Corps. Now, would a real estate agent have the duty to tell the buyer about this subdivision plaque? Yeah. Being scrupulous and meticulous, yeah. But who thinks about plaques? I mean, a developer like I, I am, I think about it. But that was already warned. You know, Cinco Ranch, that was the five guys. Fishback Wheelers, one of my best friend's grandfathers. Uh, uh, Mossbackers, Chad Nelms, and Bruce Harrison's family, and one other. Aber, no, I think it's that him. That was that huge ranch there. The only big track left in the Harris County is 10,000 acres the Josie family owned. But there's warnings like this everywhere, so pay attention to flood insurance. Don't try to use that little funny, funky little flood insurance map they give you that's a bad scale. Get you an engineer to interpret it for you. Tell that surveyor to put that line on your survey. It's going to cost your clients some extra money, so what? You're talking about millions of dollars at risk in these kind of deals. All right, water rights. We got 25 minutes left because we started five minutes late. That's a picture that I took from, I'm straddling Mexico and Texas on Amstead Dam. Off to the left there, that's the Newton family ranch, the last 18,000 acres inside Del Rio. And if you look down on the right, you'll see the city of Acuna down there. It's awful beautiful. Why should we be familiar with water rights? We don't have to say about that. You know why we should. David said this, 1976, water doesn't run downhill, it runs towards money. It's going to be that more and more in our lives. And I'll tell you something. If we've got a mega drought coming someday, we better pay attention to water. Water renders land its value. And this new thing, Bastrop, this isn't Bastrop, this is California. That woke us up, right? Bastrop woke us up. I live off Toro Canyon on the mountain between Davenport Ranch and Westlake. Already my wife and I, we were talking a minute ago, we don't get out on Westlake Drive. Hell, for golf tournament the other day, we couldn't get to our house. We're going to walk to Westlake Drive, walk to Boca Chica Crossing, which is right down there, a little dip. Used to be a water crossing. We go down to the lake, try to save our butts. 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit will reach pretty quick through those juniper trees that are protected in Westlake. And then you'll see tornadoes like you've never seen before, and hundreds of people going to die. All it takes is one. You didn't think this young man that put out bombs somewhere. What if somebody throws a Molotov cocktail on Wild Basin Ledge? 
Juniper trees are not cedar trees. They're juniper trees. They're napalm, even when they're green. And in these humid days, when we get this big wind, the, the low humidity days, I'm, it's something to think about. Chubb says that I can hire them for my insurance. They'll send somebody out and spray some goo on my house to protect it. Folks to work, work in California. I just don't see Chubb getting there to spray the goo when the fire starts. You got 10 minutes to get out of there when that fire runs. Oh, as it runs up a hill, it becomes a chimney. And what kills you, you're already dead before they burns your body. It's when you breathe that superheated air, you're dead instantly. And if anybody realized that those houses all around Wild Basin Ledge and the Buckland Preserve were the We've been able to trim some of those trees back, thank goodness. But I wouldn't want to insure those houses on my edge because if that fire comes, those houses. Hey, Travis County WCID number 10, we had our fire hydrants tested. They might put out enough water for there that would have, even when they're charged, that water my tomato plant. You know? And I can talk with, in my other class, we talk a lot. Fire's another thing to think about. I wrote that book, wrote those books, wrote those articles. Here's a new article. That's my new book. Sorry. Water, we got population growth coming, which we all like. We're going to have a shortage in water in Texas, even if our conservation. If you look at that chart, some of y'all have taken my class four. That middle line is normal rainfall. There's no such thing as normal rainfall in Texas. It's drought or deluge. Okay. Possible mega droughts, that's what happened to the Anasazi culture in the four corners. Look at that mega drought in those days. They used the Palmer Drought Severity Index is the one I like. Doesn't just count tree reeds, it counts, it analyzes the soil the tree's in, in grids, to see how much moisture it can hold. I mean, we got, we live in drought. If there is global warming in this climate change, which I, I don't doubt there is, we could have a 35-year mega drought someday. Now, drought's not, you look at, try to look up the definition of drought. There's all kinds of definitions. Doesn't mean it never rains, it just means there's not enough moisture in there. If you talk to a farmer, what does he talk? He doesn't talk about rain, he talks about moisture, right? That's morning moisture and soil moisture, things like that. 1950s drought, actually it extended into the 70s. Who owns water? Texas? Surface water is owned by the TCEQ, I mean by the state, managed by TCEQ, groundwater is owned by you, the landowner. All right? And they don't talk to each other about permitting. All right? Can I drill a well on my property? You, this is just the greatest answer of all time. It depends on where you are. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Oddest case in Texas, the rule of capture. The reason I bring this up, and y'all have heard of House Park, you know, football field where I played at Austin High. That was his, Colonel Edward, in houses, family's house there. He had, that was his stable. He was Woodrow Wilson's bag man all before World War I until Wilson got sick and Miss Wilson ran him off. But his father started the Houston and Texas Central Railroad. Real capture comes from a 1902 case that started in Denison, Texas, where all the railroads come up through Denison to go east. Remember by that time all the railroads had, been, had conglomerated together, the big fleet railroads. They finally in 1880 got a standard gauge distance between the tracks. For 1880, you take one little railroad here with a track this wide, have to unload to get to another railroad with a wider track. Okay? All the eastern capital and all that goods flowed through Denison, Texas, which is the birthplace of Eisenhower. There's another great book on Eisenhower, the greatest president we ever had, in my opinion. You don't agree. But the railroad company comes to Mr. East's house and knocks on the door. He's a policeman there. Says, how's the water here? They go out and have a drink of water in this 30-foot deep well. And the railroad company goes around the corner, has a locomotive repair yard, goes down 60 foot deep, puts in a big pump, pumps 25,000 gallons a day out, and drives it to Mr. East Well. Mr. East sues, right? Only source there was for water for people in this neighborhood was wells because there wasn't a municipal water system. There weren't municipal water systems in Texas until the 1920s, pretty much. Well, Mr. E. Sues, and the first thing I found in an article I wrote for History Journal, turns out that uh, he didn't pay a jury fee in Denison. Well, why is that? He can pay a jury fee for $2, and it's, you know, it's Well, because everybody worked for the railroad. He's pretty smart. He lost at the local district court. He has no water. The big Houston Railroad 
He said, you don't, they couldn't have known that was going to do to you. We owe you nothing. Went to Circuit Court of uh, Appeals Court in Dallas, and John Bookout from New York said, that's just wrong. There's a corroding right in groundwater. What I do to that water affects what damage water is. There has to be a right there, so railroad company paid Mr. East 1100 bucks. Well, Baker Botts is a very smart law firm. They've been around since 1840. They took the Texas Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, you're overruled. Based on the Edith's case of 1843, Acting versus Blundell, where two guys that had little industries in 1843 in Liverpool, Mr. Mr. Blundell dried up Mr. Atkins' well, and because you couldn't see underground, there's no liability. So the rule of capture came into our law at that time, and it still exists in Texas. That's where it's all from. What is it? This artist drawing I did 20 years ago. We're gophers looking at that water. Jennifer's got more money. She puts in two wells. She starts to suck up the sand with it, and all the groundwater goes to her. Me, Peter, and Bill, we're out of luck. There's no remedy on the rule of capture. Now, don't think about all aquifers being a bathtub. There's all different levels, like that upper level there. If we're in different confined layers, then they're not affect each other, even though we're just being studying the pressure differential. Down here, likely, we would affect each other. There are nine major aquifers in 21 to 23 minor. I argue with people about that all the time. And they're all infinitely different in Texas. Okay? We have control of the rule of capture to a degree. Lawsuit said you can't maliciously harm a neighbor. You can't waste it, but of course that's subjective. I'll never waste. Whatever I'm doing is not wasteful, right? Prove it. But you can't cause subsidence, and that's the big one. In fact, uh, big three industries, Smith Southwest Industries, sued Friendswood in the 80s. Friendswood's owned by Exxon, all around, they built those subdivisions around NASA, and they drilled a water well that subsided the land beneath them. So you can't call subsidence. That's why we have subsidence districts in Harrison and Fort Bend County. You also could be restricted. You can't underflow of a river. It's owned by the state. And you could be regulated by a groundwater <coughs> conservation district, which I'll talk about in a minute. We have one water cycle. The water molecule in Texas is like a chameleon. As it rolls through that cycle, it changes ownership back and forth till it goes to the sea. You want to write this down if you hadn't taken my class. An acre foot's 325, 851 gallons every time. We measure by the acre foot, about what it takes to cover a football field. Every inch of rain that falls on any one acre brings 27,154 gallons, period. Always. That's how you can figure out how much you can catch off your roof. And water ignores political boundaries, yet we manage our groundwater based on county boundaries, which causes problems. 70 to 80% of our water is used for irrigation still, and the way you understand water rights is think about three geological containers. The first one is surface water, water that flows above the ground in a water course. We follow the old Spanish colonial way, prior appropriation, first in time is first in right, period. We went through a long process in the 60s to finally prove all that, which I'll talk about in another time. Don't kid yourself. I don't care who owns the bed and bank underneath that stream. The water is owned by the state of Texas. You've got to have a permit to use for anything but domestic livestock use. Okay? That's why if you're out there pumping water out of Lake Travis without a permit to water your carpet grass, you're going to get in trouble. But they don't ever catch you until the lake goes down, then they see your pipe out there. we got water masters. Surface water masters, we've got four of them. If you're in that yellow area, the Concho River, the Texas Concho River, and I've got a 50 acre foot water right to use pump water out of, that, out of that river, I still have to go to the water master and ask for that because the water master makes a decision the first year how much water will be in that stream. Up there, you've never been able to get your full right for the last 30 years, and there's been enough water. But if I go sell it to somebody, and I say, hey, I got 50 acre feet. I better tell them I never took more than 20 acre feet because that's all I was allowed. Because the other fellow on the other side will be upset with you and sue you for $5,000 an acre foot or more for that 30 acre feet. That's a representation thing. So water masters actually control segments of certain streams. And look at that all over Texas. The Rio Grande water master, South Texas water master, now we got a grassless water master. Okay.
Diffused surface water, real quick, that's the water that runs off the ground. You catch it before it gets into a stream. That's why you can catch it off your roof. All these containers are interrelated conjunctively. I use the same old, some of y'all are <laughs> tired of me saying this, but use the same old theory. You've walked in a creek bed when you're a kid in Texas, all of a sudden you'll feel cold water coming up beneath your feet. That's the aquifer feeding the creek. You walk up a little bit further, you see a little whirlpool. That's the surface water feeding the aquifer. Okay? It happens all up and down. All those things are related conjunctively. Why is that important? Because we manage surface water without talking to the way we manage groundwater. And that's one of the biggest headaches we got in Texas. Groundwater is owned by the surface landowner. It is a vested right. It's been proven by some of the cases that I think stink, but they proved. We came up with Groundwater Conservation District in 1949. If you want to read my article in Panhandle Plains Review, read it. It's about the history. I'm the only guy I ever wrote about it. Uh, we now have 100 groundwater districts to cover 254 counties, but they don't have any money. I wrote an article about that. I analyzed every groundwater district's funds. Most district gross revenues are under $200,000. That's why they can barely open an office. Some of them have $20,000 in total revenue, the one out in Marfa. All these white areas have no groundwater district. Travis County has no groundwater district, but a little bitty one, hard to see there, is the Bart Springs district coming up through the south. We just had a bill pass to have a district. I'll show you an article about it. We can't even afford to have the election, so there's not going to be one in southwest Travis County can't afford to have the election. If you're trapped in one of those districts, right, without a groundwater district, root capture runs. Even if, say, I've got a permit, and I've got a permit for groundwater district, they permit you for irrigation and other uses, okay? Domestic livestock use is always usually exempt from permit. Different levels you can take, but always more than you'll ever use anyway. But the rural capture even runs in the district. If I have a 50 acre foot right to use irrigation water, next to my friend Big John down in Florida has the same 50 acre foot right from Evergreen District to use irrigation water, whoever gets it first gets it. If, there's, if I take all that water beneath our property, even though he's got a permit, that's not a guarantee he can get that much water. And he doesn't get to sue me over the rule of capture. A lot of people don't like the rule of capture. I feel both ways about it. We do a bunch of other things. There's a district funding. Here's the article. came out yesterday. <laughs> it was estimated for us to have the election in the new groundwater district authorized by the legislature in southwestern Travis County that Paul Workman has worked on for years. Cost $150,000 for the election, they have any money, so they cancel the election. They don't have a board. Right here in Austin, Texas, there's no groundwater district. I can drill a water well, they made something. The city's got involved like they would normally do. I can drill a water well next to somebody else. Pretty much take the water I want, but just wait till I pull out enough water underneath that house where it causes that sandwich of limestone come down and break that slab, there'll be a lawsuit about that subsidence here, but it hadn't happened yet. You can drill a water well in Houston, West University Place, you can get a drill in there, but you've got to pay the same amount for the water that they pay the city of West University Place, so why do it? We manage it differently. Got about 10 minutes. Obviously, wells affect other wells. Minerals. Okay? I wrote an article about it in the in the Texas Realtor several years ago. Look it up, 2015. It came from Trek asked TR to put together a task force to rewrite the mineral reservation document, right? That's the one addendum we got. I was on it with several other great broker, brokers around the state and several lawyers. And we, we wrote, I think, a good reservation mineral rights. We also have the accommodation doctrine. Even though someone leases, if I leased the marathon like I did for a while in my place, they didn't drill a well, I wish they would. But they have to accommodate my activities there within reason. Okay? They don't just to come, get to come in and knock over my irrigation system. All right, that's a, something that you just need to be aware of. Here's, our, here's the, the actual addendum. It does not include water, but if you don't restrict the water, they can use the water, the sand, however they want to drill. Okay? It's only used 
if you're going to reserve all or part of the mineral estate. All right? You read this article. It's, it's, it, we worked on it. I wrote, wrote that article, and a lot of lawyers looked at it. I think it's a good article to help you. But let me tell you something, folks. Please, for goodness sake, consult an attorney about mineral rights. Please. I could have seven landmen up here. They may give you seven different opinions about who owns mineral rights on an old piece of property. Most of the rentals have been severed out through the years, right? But if they're not mentioned in the deed, they've not been severed, they automatically transfer unless you reserve them, right? you got to understand that better. You all know that. You know how it works, I think. That is, a, I think the addendum is really good. Not because of me, because there was one lawyer from the Guinness Lock and Truck. Sorry, I can't remember his last name now. He'd written 1,000, count 1,000 attorney's opinion letters about who owned minerals on a piece of property. 1,000 in his career. You know how risky that is? He put a rest liability line saying, who owned minerals on this property for the gas companies from the Guinness Lock Reef. So believe me, and another guy from Cox Smith knew what they were doing. Modern court case will finish up. Bragg versus Edwards Oxford. It said that when the Evers Offer Authority back in the 90s, this took 20 years to go to trial, which is ridiculous, it said that you're denied the amount of water beneath your property under certain situations. You ask for more and they give you less. That could be a taking. They owe you compensation. That case went on for 20 years. They got a check for $2,500,000. Okay? Bureau of days passed on. Mr. McGann, I think, is older. Same kind of situation. They asked for 700 acre feet. They got 14. That was a big one. We had an, an advisory opinion from the Texas Supreme Court that said it could be a taking. Go back to the Atascosa uh, County, Atascosa County uh, Courthouse. I was looking forward to going down there because I could eat McGee's barbecue every day and watch that trial, and they settled for 950000 why would anybody settle for 950000 if you fought that for 20 years? But the family just worn out on it, you know. Two or three others, TFB versus TCEQ. The Texas Farm Bureau, TCEQ, with Carlos Rubicine, a dear friend of mine, was head of the TCEQ. During the drought of 2011, in the Texas Water Code, the Surface Water Code, it said that if there's a municipality that's in danger of health, safety, and welfare, then the TCEQ could suspend senior and junior rights. Well, the people that had senior rights on the brasses, most over the, over, the, over the state, and surface water rights, are the farmers, not the cities. Cities don't have automatic rights. So he said, well, it's so bad in the oil brasses, we're going to suspend the rights. So 700 farmers were about to curtail the rights to use what little water was there. And, and so he said, look, we need to protect these people who live in cities so they wash the city. So they can flush their toilets and not get all these diseases. Tax Farm Bureau, great people, sued, went to the Supreme Court, said, You're right. Uh, farmers get the rights to senior priority rent. So whoever's first in time is first in right in Texas, even on municipalities. Those little cities need to put on notice. Go out and get you some like alternative water source. But then you don't want to pay for the bonding interest, do you, to do that? I mean, it's going to come up, folks, pretty soon. Uvalde versus EAA, a new lawsuit just filed that groundwater district suing the EAA because they changed the rules. Why is that? Porter, wait a second. Well, the EAA has authority over the Evers Aquifer. Uvalde groundwater district has authority over the aquifers above and below it. And they think there's some project pressure conjunctive relationship between those aquifers. That's one to watch in water. Um, I talked to you about the confidential water transfer, that other case that's pending. This big one. Most cities in West Texas Panhandle have long ago started buying water rights for the future, okay? That's where some of these big numbers come from. Um, this fellow had a ranch out there, Cody Lake Ranch, and Lubbock wanted to go out and start using their groundwater because they were the dominant state, right? And you give somebody a lease there to the dominant state, you're serving it to them if you own the land. And they own the water rights, and... Supreme Court said that Lubbock, that's fine, but you can't destroy the guy's irrigation system. You can't destroy the guy's, the guy's operations there. Okay, so the accommodation doctrine laid there. All that's important to consider in Farmer Ranch, I think. Okay, well. Oops.
I'm about to finish up. Warn y'all out. I remember when I talked a few years ago, they asked me to teach the new members of the House of Representatives of Texas water rights, and it was a four-hour class. I kept thinking, well, every, every hour, at least they'll want to go to the bathroom. First hour, keep going. Second hour, keep going. Third hour, keep going. Fourth hour, keep going. We finished at midnight. And I finally just gave out. I, mean, I, was, I did it for four and a half, five hours. Surveys are critical. Ingress and egress is critical. Land is leased for everything. And remember, minerals and waters have been likely or could have been severed from land. The first time we severed water rights was in 1772 in San Antonio, just like minerals. Okay, you can sever it. All right? Remember there the dominant stake? I don't have time to talk about wind leases and other things. Water rights are terribly complicated. Remember the TCEQ? If there's a surface water right and you sell off part of your land, that water right is split out pro-rationally to the boundary land you sell out unless you preserve that water right to yourself. Right now, that water right is tremendously valuable. If you just want to transfer it between somebody next door to you, let them use it. It's a 900-day wait to process it at TCEQ. Well, who cares by that time? Your onion crop's dead already. Open or closed range status is interesting. You know about fiduciary duties. I've warned you out. Ag taxes. Please consult an attorney. <coughs> Go to these websites. There's the sources. Final thoughts, and I'll quit. Floodplain issues are now more important than ever. Please keep that in mind. Wear snake protection when you go on these sites, right? I've never been bit by a rattlesnake, but I've come close. You know, it's not just the bite. They got a lot of power hitting you. I killed one the other day. Two hours later, it was still moving, and I blew its head off. It's a muscle. And man, stay away from coral snakes. They got to chew you in between the finger, but they have a neurotoxin. You ain't going to make it to the hospital, okay? Close the gates, read the title commitment, consult an attorney. Sorry, <laughs> you've heard that enough from me. That's it. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. <laughs>